So to find the um, percent, the expected counts for each of these, we're essentially doing n times whatever that claimed percentage was. So for the dark chocolate, it was 20, so I'm going to do 120 times 0.2. Everybody good? Now, you will see that these are all sorted out, yes? And for the folks at home, I'm going to take a real quick picture so they can kind of see what's going on here. I was going to save them pieces of candy. I am noble. Yes. Okay, you guys. So as you can see, these are separated out into piles, and in fact, they're kind of grouped in fives because I already counted them. We're gonna, I'm going to give you the counts from the original bag. Is everybody with me? So from before, the fifth period class each got a piece. Okay? And those counts, and I kid you not, they watched me do this, were... 30, 30, 30, and 30. You think that's better? I, I mean, like, to me, the best one of these bags would be 100% Mr. Goodbar. No question. Does anybody else have a different favorite? Dark chocolate? Just the normal ones? Anybody a Crackle fan? I'm pretty anti-Crackle. Yeah. Chocolate and peanuts. Yeah. But better than the other ones. Okay. So let's go ahead and... So our goal today is going to be like, hey, we want to test... The claim, oh, forget this, because it was a different bag when I did it, that one. Okay, we want to test the, this particular claim from Hershey's. Okay, that these percentages are correct. Okay, you guys, as we look at our data, what do you guys think about Hershey's claim? What do you guys think about the claim that those are the percentages of each kind? It's wrong? It could be right. It could be right? It's not going to be why not? Don't press the button. Don't press the button? I've been pressing it all day. Everybody with me? Okay, so now, in order to say this claim is wrong, I could give some evidence that I think it's right because look at these. We got exactly what's expected. Whereas over here, we got, you know, six off. They're off by six. And is six a lot? At this point, you guys, I'm really hopeful that when I ask a question like, is six a lot? You go, I don't know. We should probably look at the probability that that happens. Yeah? Okay. But calculating that probability is a little bit wackadoodle. It's a little bit harder to do because, like, and would it be more meaningful if these were off by six and these were off by six? I don't know, right? Like this is starting to feel really icky, okay? So we're gonna create a statistic called a chi-squared statistic. Chi-squared is this funky X. Okay? It's not chi squared, it's not chi squared, it is chi squared. All right, so, what? Because it's a Greek letter. It's the same reason why we call this, uh, same reason why we might call this sigma instead of circle with a weird tail on it. I don't, yeah. Or we might call this sigma instead of funky looking E. Or what is the symbol? Delta. Delta, not triangle. I think it's triangle. 
This symbol is called chi squared. Okay? This is the Greek X. Okay. Now, you guys, could we, if we wanted to, let's get this picture out of the way, could we just do a Z test for the proportion of Hershey's and then do another Z test for the proportion of the special dark? Could we do that? Two Z tests. Gross. I don't want to do two tests when I can only do one. And imagine, imagine if all four categories were wrong, then we would have to do it four times, which I don't know about you guys, that's starting to feel really annoying. Cool? Okay. So what, instead what we're going to do is this value called a chi-squared test. And chi-squared, the way we calculate chi-squared is we compare what we expected to happen to what actually happened, but we do it in a funky way. All right, so chi-squared um, is made up of contributions. And you get a contribution for each category. So knowing that, guys, how many categories, or how many contributions would I have for this particular sample? Two. Eh, four. Everybody good? And the way we find the contribution for each category is we take what actually happened minus what we would have expected if the claim were true, right? So this is us assuming that the claim is true, divided by, and then we square that to account for the fact that sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive, and then we divide by the expected count. So in this case, that would be 36. Everybody with me? And this will be the contribution for Hershey's bars. What absolute value also? What is it? Why does it have to be squared? Why do you square? So, one, everything we've done with this has been squaring, right? Like when we did standard deviation, it was squaring. When we did um, R squared and stuff, that was squaring. The reason we do that has to do with, um, how do I say this? You're in pre-calc right now, right? Okay. When we square something, we end up with a parabola, right? You good? Yeah. If I take two equations of parabolas and add them together, I combine my like terms, right? And I end up with one bigger parabola. Cool? That's not this, the, tr the same is not true for absolute value. If I take two absolute value equations and I add them together, what I have is two absolute values being added together. I can't combine like terms through absolute value. That's why. All right, you guys. What is the contribution then for just the Hershey's bars? One, okay. And then if I do the contribution for the next one, it would be uh, 30 minus 24 squared over 24. Everybody with me? And this is the contribution for the dark chocolate. And we are getting 3 over 2, which I'm going to call 1.5. Okay. And then um, 30 minus 30 squared over 30 is going to be zero. And then, you know, the other 30 minus 30 squared over 30 would be zero. Yeah. Could you do, uh, I don't know if this is necessary or not, it's definitely not in this case, but could you do the same thing with the proportions, like the sample proportion minus the population proportion? No, and the reasoning is similar to this, okay? Remember Joy? And we said four out of five would not convince us. Oh, yeah, yeah. But 40 out of 50 would. Oh, you need the sample size. Like, we need to account for the bigger sizes, yeah. We feeling okay? And essentially, what each of these values are, are, um, <clears throat> you guys said off by six, right? That's what we said? Off by, they're off by six. Off by six means a lot of different things depending on different sizes, okay? So I like to think about chi-squared as, well, each 
contribution is the weirdness of that category, the unexpectedness of that category. And so when we do chi-squared, chi-squared is the total unexpectedness. Cool? So chi-squared, if I wanted to calculate it, would be 1 plus 1.5 plus 0 plus 0 is total of 2.5. And um, it's in, in some ways a total, the total of the deviation from what's expected. The total weirdness of the sample, if that, no, that, null hypothesis, which is going to be that the claim is actually correct. Yeah? Does that mean a lot of deviation or not like, what's the reference? Oh my gosh, did you know that my next question was going to be, you guys, is that a lot? It's not standard deviations, because this is categorical variables, yeah? Oh, it is. Again, I know, I, know, I know what happens in AP Bio. Okay? So the question should really become, is that a lot? Depends, okay, on a lot of things. But are you with me that what we want to do is to decide, is that a lot or not? It is figure out what's the probability this could happen. Is this okay? So in order to calculate that probability... We need to know a whole lot more about how chi-squareds tend to behave. Cool? Okay. So, chi-squareds have a lot involved. These are different chi-squared distributions with different, what we call degrees of freedom. Chi-squared also has degrees of freedom. What do you notice about every single one of these graphs? Skewed right. And here's the reason that happens. You guys, chi-squared is calculated as if there, everything is close to the expectation. Right? That the expected, the expect, the expected counts are what's, what we should have, are true. Yeah? That we should get somewhere near the expected counts because that original claim is a true claim. And so what happens is, most of the time, if, that, if the claim is true, you're going to get low values for chi-squared, and every once in a while, the wonky samples will pull you to the right. You get larger values. Every once in a while, you'll randomly get a sample that doesn't match. Okay? All right. So, the first thing I need you guys to recognize is that chi-squareds are not normal, so we will not be having a normal condition for anything with chi-squared. Okay? Now, you guys, what if I had given you the exact same kind of example, but it was about Skittles? The colors of Skittles in a package. Everybody with me? How many categories are there for Skittles, colors of Skittles in a typical garden variety package? Five. So how many contributions to chi-squared would I have? Five. So getting, are you guys with me, that getting a chi-squared value of 2.5 when you have four categories means something different than when you have five categories. Does that make sense? If, I'm, if I have five categories, I'm adding more numbers together, 2.5 isn't as meaningful. Depends on how many categories I'm adding to whether or not that 2.5 is meaningful. Okay? So chi-squared graphs have degrees of freedom and but this time our degrees of freedom is not about the sample size the size of the amount in each category isn't important it's how many categories i'm adding into chi squared so your degrees of freedom for the test that we're working on right now is going to be the number of categories minus one so thinking through the example we just worked what would our degrees of freedom be our degrees of freedom would be three Yeah, because that's meaningful too. That tells us that the that tells us that the claim was close on some of the categories. 
Okay. All right. So you guys, real quick. In order to run a test, we need to have hypotheses, right? My null hypothesis is going to be that the, the distribution of candy type matches Hershey's claim. You guys, if that's my null hypothesis, what's my alternative going to be? It doesn't match. Okay. I could write this in symbols. The symbols might look like this. P for Hershey's is equal to 0.3. P for dark chocolate equals 0.2. P for crackle equals 0.25. P for good bar is equal to 0.25. Now, in order for the claim to be incorrect, we would say at least one P, and I'm going to use a subscript of I for that's kind of like a general for all of them, is incorrect. And if you do it in symbols, you might say P sub I equals the true proportion of that kind of candy. And these are the point where I think if you wanted to put the null hypothesis in, in words instead, I actually think it might be easier. It definitely is next week for the other test that we're going to learn, that you don't learn in AP Bio. Everybody good? All right. Our conditions are no longer random normal independent. They are random, which we're going to... Do the same thing we've, all, we've always done. Is it given or not? Okay. What the large sample size condition is, is and which is similar to the normal condition, is basically our sample size needs to be large enough that the chi-scores behave the way they should. Okay. And in order for that to happen, what you need is your expected counts to be greater. All of your expected counts need to be greater than or equal to 5. And then we'll check that independent condition the same as always. Is that the last 10%? 10% if it's a sample, um, which for the goodness of fit test it will be. Um, and then next week when we learn the chi-score test for association, the chi-score test for homogeneity, which are something new, obviously. It'll be different. Okay, so Beckett has been very, very patient. Because he asked a question, and we still haven't really answered it yet. Like, is two and a half a lot? Right? So, um, you guys, this table is everything we just did on the front page. So, let's not stress about it. This, by the way, this formula of, like, how to calculate chi-squared, the sum of those contributions, is on your formula sheet. Okay? So, you would not be expected to have this memorized. Um, our value for chi-squared was 2.5, Right? So now, what I need to decide is, how likely is it, with three degrees of freedom, remember we just said that, that we get a chi-squared value of two and a half. Well, so I'm going to sketch a right-skewed graph because, you know, chi-squareds are right-skewed. My degrees of freedom was three. 2.5 is here. Can I use normal CDF or TCDF to answer this question? Why not? Because it's not normal. But anytime we were calculating a p-value by hand, we went with some sort of CDF, yes? So I'm going to go into that distributions menu. Whoa. Do you guys see chi-squared CDF? Do you see it, everybody? You guys, why did I shade to the right?
Yeah, and are you guys with me that for chi squared, more extreme is always going to be to the right? Because, like, more extreme samples would be further from what's expected. We good with this? Okay. Um, hey, guys, what are we getting? So we want to know the probability that chi squared is greater than 2.5. So you guys, is two is a chi squared value of two point five a lot? Not really. Could that have happened by chance? Yeah. Very likely to well not very likely, but reasonably likely to occur by chance that you get a two point five or higher. So if Hershey's had made that claim, would this be correct? Would our sample be enough to reject that idea? No. Nah. Relatively high p value. By the way, that is what this is. Yeah, you guys know that this is a p value. Yeah? Okay. You guys, we use TCDF for a hot minute to find a p-value, right? Remember, I put that on a quiz, and you guys got so irritated with me. And you could use a z-score to find a p-value using normal CDF, right? Okay. But in reality, you guys just use the shortcut in your calculator, yeah? Okay. So don't do this yet. There is a chi-squared, there are two chi-squared tests in your calculator. For right now, we're doing the goodness of fit test because that's the test we're working is the GOF test. So we're going to pick chi-squared GOF. And my calculator's asking, where are my observed and my expected counts? Okay, what this is, the reason I'm pointing this out is if you want to run this test in the calculator, you got to hit stat, edit, and put your observed counts in L1 and your expected counts in L2, as I have done, yes? Everybody good? Do you guys remember how to put this in your calculator? Okay, so once I have that, and I go, go do that chi-squared GOF test, you know, like, I was hoping to cheat and not have to go through this. You guys, is this all correct? You see what I have to tell it? Where my observed counts are, where my expected counts are. And then, you know, I go down to calculate. And you can see the chi-squared statistic, right? So that it'll give us our chi-squared statistic. It gives us the p-value. We told it the degrees of freedom. And then it also gave me the contributions in the order that we put them in. Yes? Would we need to write that if we were... It would be really wise of you to write those. But you don't have to do each and every one of them by hand. That's ridiculous. Everybody good? You guys. So that whether I do it by hand or not, I get the same values. So what conclusions can we make? Since 0.475 is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null. Yeah, and cannot. Conclude that Hershey's claim is incorrect. At this point, if you would like to come grab a piece of candy, you may. Peanuts and chocolate. Mr. Goodbar? Oh, there's a lot of No way. Sub, you're wrong. 
All right, you guys, I would like you to write the hypotheses for this example. I think I should mix these before. Yeah, I'm going to. You know why? Because if kids are going to steal some, I don't want them to steal and give Mr. Goodberg on top because they're my favorite. I really do. You know the biggest problem with Mr. Goodbye? Just take them out of there. I know. What's the biggest problem? Mr. Richards. <laughs> they are also his favorite. Here, He's going to come steal them all. Do you think he comes in here when you're not looking at steal them? Uh, he comes in here when I am looking. He already has months today. He stole his Snickers. Also, if you guys can find out which person is putting more candy in my candy jar. But the candy he's putting in there does not match the candy he keeps in his classroom. She would never do anything nice for me. How do we do? So that would be PS equals 0.1 P, and then the you would have to define P. So P sub I is the true proportion of each size box sold. And then uh, your alternative would be at least one of the PIs is incorrect. Okay, you guys, what procedure should we use to test these hypotheses? The true proportion of that size box. What procedure should we use? Chi squared goodness of fit test. You're going to shoot. You can just write chi squared GOF test. That is fun. And are our conditions met? the random condition met? We good? What was that large sample size? The expected counts have to be greater than five. Do we know the expected counts? 
You can. Um, here is my suggestion to you. Put the observe. Go ahead and put your observe counts in. All right, and we know in this case n was 120. That's given to us in the stem, right? You can just say, like, for instance, for the small 10%, you could just do 0 0.1 times 120, and it'll put it in there for you. Like, it'll, and that, so that way what you're doing, so now 12, and then this one I'm going to do um, 0.15 times 120. I get 18. So that way you're, like, putting them in the calculator as you're, it's a little bit quicker. That's what I do anyway. And those are in fact greater than or equal to five. Independent, 120 is less than 10% of cereal purchases. This makes me want Captain Crunch. I feel that you said that specifically to be cranky with me. No, it's just a weird, like, I've never heard anybody say it like that really. Well, technically I want Captain Crunch Crunch Berry because the Crunch Berries make it totally worth it. That just makes it free loops. <laughs> so once we do our conditions, we can uh, go get our test. What would, you guys, what's our degrees of freedom here? Three. You guys, I got my chi squared to equal 9.51, my p value to point to, to equal 0 0.023, and my contributions to be 1.33 to 1.68. And then if you just hit the over button, I can't do it because my calculator is different, like I can just drag. But if you just hit the right arrow, it'll, sh it'll move over to show you the rest of them. All right, now what? Now we, now we just need to make a conclusion. Point zero two three is in fact less than 0.05. You can reject the null. You guys, if I reject the null, how many hypotheses I got? Therefore, we can conclude the distribution of box sizes sold has changed. If I asked you, how did it change, what would you say? The jumbo is more popular or less popular? Okay, so, and why jumbo? Why did you guys pick jumbo? It had the largest contribution to chi-squared. So we'll talk about this a whole lot more tomorrow. But essentially, one of the reasons we write down these contributions is because, like, a follow-up analysis, you would want to know which one isn't right, the one with the largest contribution. So we could probably say that this one's, a lot more people chose this and reasonably less people chose the other groups.